duck and cover. Hello and welcome to Surviving Classical Music. I'm Andrew Byrne, and today I'm speaking with Carissa Klopischek, who's a Canadian violinist, member of Ottawa's National Arts Centre Orchestra and the Ironwood Quartet, and is artistic director of Ottawa's Chamber Fest, whose summer festival takes place at the end of July and beginning of August every year. Carissa, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. So begin with, to begin with, could you give our listeners an idea of what the current situation is re-COVID uh, in Ontario, in Ottawa, and that sort of thing? Absolutely. Um, simply put, uh, the arts are, are opening at a slower rate than uh, many other places. Ontario is, is dealing with things quite differently. Uh, health is regulated, as many will know, provincially uh, in Canada, so every province tackles it in their own way. Uh, we've been watching some of our neighbors opening with a little bit more rapidity. Uh, we are not. We've just entered step three of a three-step reopening plan, which now allows uh, indoor audiences. Uh, so we are about to, uh, we're, we're very actually very excited and thrilled to finally have some in-person audiences again this summer um, at the festival, which we were hopeful for, but hadn't had any confirmation until just a few days ago. So we're really, really thrilled about that. Uh, and we've got a great two-week festival planned um, with many artists. They're all uh, Canadian. We're celebrating Canadian this year because our borders are still uh, not open for anything but essential travel, and that does not necessarily count what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And we still have the two-week quarantining um, regulation in place. Right. So we just knew that that would be far too complicated for any visiting artists mm -hmm. to make that happen in their schedules. Um, we're feeling great, grateful that we planned it this way. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, vaccination rates are, are pretty high, um, and the caseload in Ottawa, uh, yesterday was one, uh, one new case yesterday. So we're, we're doing very well right. in that way. And so that's kind of a nice confirmation that we're, we're on a good path here. Right. That feels good. So, <laughs> but of course the festival in general, I mean, of course, not just an artistic turn, which you've just mentioned, but the, 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 the bones, the structure, you know, the technical thing, the, the, the festival it is going on a hybrid model now. Yes. So with the mm. with the arrival of COVID last year, I think it, of course, caught everyone by surprise mm. and everyone had a few months to just try to figure out what to do. Um, and Chamber Fest, this is actually a little bit before I joined. I, I took on the artistic directorship during this pandemic, which is, I don't know, either foolish or brave, <laughs> depending on how you look at things, sure. but uh, the, uh, maybe both. <laughs> so the... Uh, we established something called Chamber Chats, which was just an interview program over Zoom. And so we've been doing that for this whole year, which has been really great, uh, a great way to keep our audience and our artists engaged and connected and paid mm -hmm. uh, for the artists, which has been really great. And then that gave us a little bit of time to think about what we could do when, uh, in terms of presenting concerts. Um, we were locked down. We were not able to do that for a while, but we had planned uh, for September, we began a hybrid concert presentation model. So in our home base, which is Carlton Dominion Chalmers Center, it's a former church now owned by university, beautiful concert hall. Um, we were able to um, both live stream and invite in-person audiences into our concerts in very small numbers. Mm -hmm. The maximum we could have is 50 at any given time. Um, the theater holds 850. So it's a very sparse kind of feeling, mm -hmm. but we were grateful to have it um, and so we've got an amazing technical team, you know, 10 people working behind the scenes, uh, many of them from CDCC, the venue, mm -hmm. and supplemented with some of our people uh, that are, you know, working through four camera angles, professional audio, and we are switching live. We are actually live streaming, which is something that's very important to me. I think that there's something magical that's happening when everyone knows that they're watching in real time at home. I like that. Yep. So, uh, and then the audience that's in the hall is seeing exactly the same experience too, mm -hmm. which I really think is great. And so um, also to make it a little bit more real for some of the people who were watching from home, we called you know, front row from home, we uh, invited them to participate in a question and answer period where they would write in their questions and then I would sort of interview the artists from the stage reading in real time te uh, questions as they came in, which was a lot of fun and a way to make it seem interactive and actually, you know, in the moment, for the people at home. Mm -hmm. 
so we were able to do this with, uh, you know, we, ha- we had quite a few stops and starts this year. We were shut down. We were in these different color zones. Um, right. When we were in anything like orange or better, yep. we could have 50 people and that was great. Otherwise, if we were beyond that, then we could live stream only. And then beyond that, nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And we had a little bit of all of those things this winter. Um, But we were able to have audiences at, I think, five concerts. And we could present eight in total of the many that we had planned. Mm -hmm. And what that means for me is that we were really well practiced for this summer. Uh, So we know that we can accommodate... um, well, more than 50 at, at the venue this summer. We're still working on the exact numbers because it's a matter of percentages plus two meter spacing for everyone. Sure, and masks sure, sure, sure. Still indoors. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so the seat maps are being drawn as we speak, yeah, right? Yeah, I understand. But, but this but is all taking are... place in one venue. No, actually, uh, I'm speaking right now. Uh, we, the concert series that we had done was all in this one venue, okay. our home base. But the festival... Uh, we also banked on, we weren't sure if we would have indoor, in-person audiences. So we've actually um, created, a, a, well, we have many venues that are outside. So we have Carlton Dominion Chalmers. We also have this amazing uh, stone courtyard where we will be presenting and live streaming from as well. Uh, in-person and live stream for almost everything that we do. Uh, Beechwood Cemetery, which is a really, it's a national cemetery mm-hmm. in Ottawa here. It has beautiful grounds with lots of little nooks and crannies and amazing places. So we've got a couple of walkabout concerts there, some concerts in the sacred space there. Uh, we have, uh, we're working with the Steinway Piano Gallery here in Ottawa, and we're doing some parking lot concerts there. Some of the new music, some piano-centric music. Uh, we've got lots of things going on. Mm-hmm. And, and so we, we tried to just hedge our bets and, and, and create something that's going to allow for the most flexibility and we're gratified to know that, you know, it paid off because now we can have audiences indoors and outdoors safely. We know how many now, so we can plan with the week remaining before the festival. Yeah. Uh, we can make it happen. So really looking forward to all of that. So obviously you're producing these live streams in-house, right? With, a, as you said, a certain help from from the outside, of but of the venue um, when you're doing it indoors in Dominion Chalmers. Um mm-hmm. But you are also adding to the digital only program concerts which are labeled as live from. So live from New York or Antwerp or et cetera, et cetera. Um, Absolutely. Are these concerts pre-recorded or are they yes. streamed live? Okay. Those ones are actually pre-recorded and, and we're clear about that. It's something that's important to me. I like that. Um, the It's our way of keeping our international connection because in, uh, Ottawa Chamber Fest is a very international festival. Mm-hmm. We we typically have people from all around the world visiting and it's a really big festival. It's, 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 I would say the largest in Canada. So it, it's something that's, it's important um, to maintain those connections with some of these artists who have come year after year, uh, like Henrik Alpers, the Honens laureate pianist um, who is based in Berlin. He's recording something from Hanover for us. Um, and he was in the middle of a Be- Beethoven cycle. So he'll be performing some things to do with that, but we're saving the good stuff for when he can, not the good stuff, but he's so this, the remainder of the sonata sure. for when he can come and return and join us again in person. Yeah. But in the meantime, he'll be playing some um, symphony transcriptions, so, you know, other fun stuff. Um, and other, you know, Canadian friends too, like Lara St. John living in New York. She's going to contribute to us. Rob Capolo, who does a lot of great music talks. He'll be presenting as well. The Danel Quartet, wonderful Belgian quartet, they'll be uh, performing for us, um, well, a French quartet based in Belgium, and and really looking forward to this very much. And we're actually, we've connected with some of the embassies to make these shows happen too. So when you look to the future, do you see that this hybrid model is something that you want to keep regardless of the situation going forward? I think that live streaming is here to stay in some way or another. Um, I think we're going to find a, a good balance. Um, personally, I, I, mean, we, I think we all agree that there's nothing like um, the magic that's created when you're participating in a concert, you know, either by performing it or being in the room. There's the connection that it's just undeniable. Um, and so that will be 
I'm sure, the primary focus remaining. However, I think there's so much to be said for the increased accessibility that live streaming offers Mm -hmm. um, and what we can do. Um, And it's, you know, it's nice that we've taken the, well, that we've we've had, we've been forced into this opportunity to to really know, uh, to to learn the craft of doing that and trying to do it well. Um, And so I don't think we would want to let all of that education go to waste. We'd like to use it again. Um, So I, I think it's here to stay. How? We don't know exactly. I'm sure a lot of people listening will know that as soon as you add that kind of element, you're increasing the expenses of what you're doing quite a lot. So, you know, there's something to be considered there as well. However, it's kind of a wonderful thing. And it also means that, you know, festivals or organizations like ours no longer have, you know, physical borders the same way that we did. So there's an opportunity there, too. It's kind of nice. Okay, so going exactly to what you had just mentioned about budget, um, if we are in a situation where we continually have limitations on the audience that we can host. Now, we are still only, you know, 18 months in, maybe that's too, maybe that's even too long, maybe it's more like 16 months in, where nobody has really um, been hit. You know, governments have, have really said, okay, let's stop spending. Um, it's still like, let's just, let's try and keep things going. Let's kind of supercharge our way out of this, um, in a situation where, um, you don't have the, the special funding for going digital, um, or the, uh, uh, and this Mm -hmm. becomes a consistent problem where people, maybe you don't have as many people as you would like to have in person. Um, and the live streaming is sort of necessary, but it becomes harder and harder to get special funding to, to, uh, to support the streaming. Is there a, you know, do you see streaming in general, the production, the added cost as a sustainable, um, as, as sustainable period? Um, yes, I do. I think, um, there's a few elements to that. One is we at Chamberfest are eternally grateful for the support that we receive. And a lot of that is from government. Mm. Um, And the government, both um, provincial and federal levels, have really come through for us with some surprise extra money. But I will say that none of it has been um, specifically for live streaming. So that's not really something that we're actually dealing with and maybe losing. Um, So, but they are, the governments are very interested in making sure that our organizations survive. So it's it's really about um, organizational mm-hmm, funding, mm, okay. which is important. And then we can use we can use it how we see fit to make sure that we thrive right. going forward. Right. Um, also, we are absolutely um, dumbfounded by the level of support that we have from um, our patrons, um, people who donate just a little bit here and there or more sizable donations. All of them matter and they keep us running. And we've noticed that during this pandemic, um, we, we've met or exceeded mm-hmm. the, the donations that we've had in the past because people care about uh, organizations that they're attached to, and that makes a big difference for us. Right. I would also say we're learning about this live streaming right now, and so I think that we can streamline some of the expenses going forward. Once we, you know, what might take a, ta- a team of 10 right now, well, so for instance, you know, we've done this hybrid model all year. And we've worked with one hall with this team of eight or ten. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, someone's reading the score live, another person is switching. I'm sure that this can be streamlined. This summer, though, at the festival, we'll be running five venues simultaneously and live streaming from them. So already we're being, uh, we're encouraging ourselves to yeah. um, upscale, figure out how to yeah. stream, streamline it and make sure. So I think that it's something that we're just going to be figuring out as we go and, and mm-hmm. becoming more confident in as we go. Mm-hmm. So we'll find a way to do that and to, to, to make it as um, economical as we can right. while never um, uh, losing the production values because I think that if you are going to be live streaming, again, it's a personal preference, but for me it's really important that the production values are very high. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I don't, I don't personally find it as enjoyable to watch um, and I don't think that it conveys the same emotional content mm-hmm. um, without that. So that that's for me. Yeah. I have to say that snobbery, watching, maybe, but it's fun. watching live streams from Canadian festivals or series this this past season, um, I specifically single out Early Music Vancouver 
um, as yeah. the sta- as the by far highest standard. They clearly have a sort of Hollywood style team working. I don't. It's not in house, obviously, from someone who's. I'm part of a live streaming team right now, uh, um, and what I see there is is clearly above and beyond the Call of Duty in terms of mm-hmm. the level. Um, but I guess my question is, is that is you know. Is there a line? Is there a line which is which is essentially good enough? Could be like, uh, and nothing should drop below the quality, um, or is it sort of the sky is the limit? Because I, I think the what I'm what I'm a bit what I'm getting at a little bit is that if it becomes a, a nuclear arms race of who can have the best quality live stream, it's it's not it's not going to like a festival is going to collapse over that f- fight. But what what ends up I'm a bit worried about is that you have musicians who are coming up today who are maybe in five years time who are graduating now who had a tough time in school this last year who are looking towards your festival or whatever saying in five years time I'd love to play there but there's no way I could ever be able to self-produce a concert at the level of which I'm seeing being done on on you know, which is being promoted by Canadian festivals and series that um, you've got musicians who are who who feel that they're they can't cross a threshold of being noticed because the level of production at, at festivals is getting higher and higher. If you know what I mean, I don't think I think those are very separate issues. Okay. I think artistically, when I'm listening to um, younger performers, that that's not what I'm looking for. I, I don't. It's it's not about that. It's about the musical, the communication that they're trying to convey. Um, and then it's my job as a festival artistic director to have a team in place to make the presentation of this art artistry um, how I want it. So would you say that um, when a, if someone is graduating today, that their mm-hmm. focus should be the same focus as it was pre-pandemic? Focus on being a good musician. Well, yes, I think I would not not at the expense of everything else. But right. first and foremost, our job is to be communicative artists sure. who have something to say and something to share yeah. and that can be done in so many ways yes practice your scales do you know be the best that you can be but also um think about what you're programming be thoughtful in your choices um conduct yourself well with others be a joy to rehearse with you know all of the things that we know i don't think any of that will change mm-hmm. because chamber music is still chamber music above all and and my goal is never to have a live stream only anything you know um it still is about the interaction in that room. And I mean, yes, this does happen. There will be digital only content at some point. And then in which case that is, it is a little bit of a different beast and there will some people that will take to it better than others. And that's fine. But I think there's always going to be an opportunity for people who want to collaborate. Um, But to ask your initial question of, you know, is there a line which is it's good Mm -hmm. enough? Yes. I I think there's also a line where it's just too much. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a, there's a point where, um, if it becomes a little too Hollywood, then, you know, what are we watching or what is the focus of what we're trying mm-hmm. to do? For me, when I say, you know, what I aim for, and, and there's always the sky is the limit when it comes to sure. this. You can always improve um, the, the elements of lighting. You can always improve just, you yeah. know, just beautiful placement of microphones to really make the experience as intimate mm-hmm. and as, um, you know, just as as present mm-hmm. as it can be for the people watching from home. I uh, sometimes find, I mean, this is, and this is a matter of taste again, right? Sometimes you watch productions that are very slick. There's so many camera changes, though. It's like you feel like you've not settled into one angle mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. it's switched because something sure. else is happening. And, and so I think there is a line where it's just bec- it becomes too busy. And I think I, one of the things that I enjoy, so we're not, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're not, uh, I don't know how to describe it. I don't know that we're in-house. We're a mix. Okay. We have our team that, that come with the venue and we supplement it with a few other, uh, f- you know, like freelance professional audio engineers and other people. And then I'm there behind the scenes to produce as well, to, to indicate my preferences mm-hmm. as the director, to to make things appear how I'd like them to. And then, we're, of course, we're all limited by, well, this is the lighting that exists in this venue mm-hmm. or, you know. And we can supplement it and we do what we can. But again, it's just, you know, learning each time as we go. For me, it's really about how can I best convey 
what's happening on this stage right now so that people at home can get a very similar experience. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hoping to do. Um, that's what I'm hoping to do at this point. And, and, you know, and then there are other beautiful productions too, like the Against the Grain Theater with their Messiah and then another opera that they've just mm -hmm. released, video projects. That's a totally different ballgame. Yeah. That's not a live stream. Yes, yes. That's a yeah. video. And, and but I think that some people maybe don't make that distinction anymore because a lot of live streams that you see on um, festivals or that kind of thing, they are pre-recorded, right. which is a different thing. You can edit completely differently. So I'm very proud of what we do because we, you know, we are unrehearsed switching on the yeah, fly. Yeah. It's just like calling a sports game. It's like a lot more. It's fun, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really great. Um, have you been on the other side of the camera in a live stream so far? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Would you say, yeah. with that, with both experiences in mind now, would you say that there is? I I guess I, here's the other, here's the question I'd say. Would you say that as a director and as a musician, would you specifically, if you knew that your audience was a live stream only audience, versus an in person audience, if you had the choice, could would you? perform differently depending on which the given situation or would it always be the same i wouldn't perform differently but i would tailor things differently other elements like what um programming when and how you speak to the audience um just like at what points do you speak to mm. the audience do I stay out on stage the entire time? Do I, like elements of, I don't think that it would change the way that I perform. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does naturally without you meaning to. I think that there's something, we're all getting used to playing four cameras. It's, a, it's an odd experience mm -hmm. for most musicians. Um, in fact, yesterday I played a concert, a chamber music concert outdoors for a public, the largest one I've seen in a mm -hmm. while, you know, 150 people, something like that. And it, it's quite overwhelming because that's the whole point of what we're doing like i'm not i'm not trying to record something for posterity to for it to exist in the sure. ether i'm trying to communicate a musical sure. idea to a group of people and so for me it's really important that when i'm playing for a live stream i love knowing um personally as a music musician i really like to know who's watching at mm -hmm. home like if i know in advance that a couple of friends or a relative or so and so is saying Oh, I'm I'm going to be watching that mm -hmm. tonight. It helps me personalize the experience that I'm in. I'm playing to these people just like I would if I could see their face in the hall. But uh, that so it takes a little bit of extra sort of I don't know what the word is. Uh, you have to find it in yourself to kind of to do that. But there's something. But I think that there is no difference in what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to convey that we're all trying to convey beautiful musical ideas. And I think that if you're doing it well in live and recorded, it will come across the same way, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, Carissa Klopashak, thank you very much for speaking to me today. Thank you so much for having me. These are really fun questions. Thank you. That's it from us this week. If you would like to support this podcast, then of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click the little bell attached to it so you can get updates whenever we put up a video. We're making videos every week now. There's also, of course, the audio version of this podcast, which is available in any of your podcasting apps. Just search Surviving Classical Music. Also, don't forget to consider becoming a patron via Patreon if you really want to help us out. Thanks very much for listening and have a nice week. Bye-bye.